In a nutshell, Ket is a language native to Siberia, which is very, very distantly related to many Native American languages, including Navajo, native to the southwestern United States, a good 10,000 kilometers away. Please join me in a fascinating journey through the history of the only actual live link between the Old World and the New World. In this video, which is going to be very, very long, I want to first talk about who the Ket people are and tell you about their history, some of their traditions, their culture, and some fascinating stories that I've read about them. Then we'll briefly go over on how the language itself works, what makes it so special, what it sounds like, and we'll conclude the video by discussing the actual Dine Yenisein hypothesis and what makes the whole thing somewhat controversial. If the Dine Yenisein hypothesis is true, like most linguists in the field they say that it is, even though there is still disagreements in the actual origin of the link and the methodology used during research, it's probably one of the greatest linguistic discoveries ever made. Spoiler alert, as someone who's already spent countless hours reading a thousand different studies on this, both American and Russian, I am inclined to believe that it's true, and I hope that by the end of this video you'll see my reasoning for this, and the reasoning of the dozens of other researchers and linguists who are much smarter than me and have years of first-hand experience. So without further ado, the Ket people. The Ket people are native to the region along the mighty Yenisei River, approximately in the middle of Krasnoyarsky Krai in Russia. As of the last reliable survey in 2021, there are just under 1,100 Ket people living in Russia, and out of them, there are approximately 150 native speakers of the Ket language. However, as we'll see in a bit, these numbers are rather generous and very nuanced, but I just wanted to give you a broad understanding of the size of the community we're talking about before we start getting into the more technical stuff. Today, the Ket people primarily live in a few villages on the middle of the Yenisei River and its tributaries, with the largest of them being the village of Kellog, located on the Yelogui River. With a population of about 300 people, Kellog is considered to be sort of like the center of Ket culture today. Keep in mind that the region we're talking about is extremely remote. Not a single village is connected to any kind of wider road system that connects with the rest of Russia. The only way of getting in and out of here is either by boat, there are apparently some long distance ships going between Krasnoyarsk in the south and Dudinka in the far far north, which is pretty cool, or by helicopter, which brings provisions and medical aid to the villages here once in a while. The Ket region is proper Siberia, thousands upon thousands of square kilometers of endless forests and mountains. Winters here can be rather brutal, very long and very dark, with temperatures dropping to minus 50 Celsius, while summers are very short and very hot, with temperatures getting up to 30 Celsius. Also mosquitoes. Lots and lots of very big and very hungry mosquitoes. I really cannot stress enough how in the middle of nowhere all of this is, where the Ket people live. Combined with the fact that most houses here are wooden log cabins without running water, diesel generators for electricity, barely any telephone lines, and many wild animals lurking around, this type of lifestyle isn't for everyone. However, at the same time, you can't really deny that this is an absolutely gorgeous piece of land, and I can definitely understand continuing to live here despite the hardships, especially if you're native to the land, and I really cannot wait to explore all of this myself. In any case, how did the Ket get here and what were their lives like in the past leading up to today? Back in the olden days, the Kets were a semi-nomadic people, hunting and gathering their way through the Siberian wilderness. In the winter, they mostly hunted foxes, elks, squirrels, and even bears. Summers, on the other hand, were mostly devoted to fishing, but also duck hunting. Reindeer herding wasn't really a Ket thing back then, unlike many other indigenous peoples in the area. It only got introduced much closer to modern times. Like many other indigenous peoples in the area, the Kets have traditionally lived in these tent-like structures called Chum. Pretty standard thing. But in winter, the Kets were also known to build these more complex dugouts called Zimlyanka in Russian. And they even sometimes had a piece of ice instead of a window that didn't melt all winter long. And honestly, these weren't all that common. Most tribes in the area lived in chums all year round. So the Kets were a bit ahead of the curve on this one. The Kets practiced shamanism, and the way it was all structured and organized was quite complex. There were different kinds of shamans, different classes, different levels, different categories, and honestly, it's a bit reminiscent of choosing your own character class in a video game today. The main classes were bear, eagle, dragonfly, reindeer, and anthropomorphic bear man, called Kandelok. And each of these classes had their own unique traits, strengths and weaknesses, and special abilities. There's a guy on YouTube I found called The Bro Fesser. Massive shout out to him, he seems like a really cool dude, link to his channel in the description. 
and he goes much more in depth on how Ket shamanism worked, and I highly recommend you check it out if you're curious to find out more. The last Ket shaman died sometime in the 70s, by the way. Unfortunately, it's not really practiced today anymore, and most Kets today are Christians, either Protestant or Russian Orthodox. However, at the same time, the Kets have these house dolls, which are used to represent different kinds of spirits that protect the house and such, and they're still quite popular today. A lot of people seem to think that they look really weird and creepy, but I don't know, if I lived where they live, I wouldn't mind having one of these things keeping watch over my house. I'd definitely feel much safer. Bows and arrows have always been the traditional weapons that the Kets used. However, they've also had access to guns for over 300 years at this point, ever since they bumped into the Russians, or rather, the Russians bumped into them. The Kets are also known to be very good shots, by the way, so better not mess with them. Continuing on with history, the Russians started pushing eastward and the Russian conquest of Siberia is said to have officially begun in the year 1580. The Russians reached the Ket homeland by the late 1500s and had already begun settling in the area by the early 1600s, raiding through the whole place, constructing fortresses all throughout Siberia. One of the sources I used for research mentioned a really cool urban legend about how the Russians introduced bread to the Kets for the very first time and I thought it'd be pretty cool to mention it here. The story goes that a bunch of Russians were camped out on the river, sitting around a campfire eating bread. A bunch of cat people were nearby and they started smelling something that smelled very good, so they approached the campfire. The Russians offered to share some bread with the cats since they'd never tried it before, but they became frightened and refused because they were worried that the Russians wanted to poison them. Eventually, an old cat woman basically goes, I'll try it, I'm super old anyway, if this is how I go, then so be it. At least I'll have tried something new. Now hand over the bread. The old lady tries it, likes it, doesn't die, and everyone's happy. And ever since then, the Kets have been eating bread. <laughs> now back to Ket history. In the earliest historical references, the Kets have been referred to as the Ostyaks. The term Ostyak appears quite often in various letters and literature up until the early 20th century. Over the past few centuries, it was used to, mistakenly, refer to the most random ethnic groups all over the Ural region and Siberia from the Turkic Bashkirs to the Uralic Hanti and Mansi, and even the Yeniseyan Ket. Later on, the Kets would be referred to as specifically the Yeniseyan Oystyaks, to differentiate them from other Oystyaks. But the term today isn't really used that often anymore, and could actually potentially be seen as offensive to some people. The first time any actual data was collected on the Kets was in the early 1700s, and honestly, it's a pretty wild story on its own. There was a guy called Philip Johann von Stralenberg, who was a captain in the Swedish army during the Great Northern War fighting against the Russian Empire. In 1709, during the Battle of Poltava, Stralenberg was captured by the Russians, became a prisoner of war, and exiled to Siberia. After living there for the better part of 10 years, he met a German physician and biologist by the name of Daniel Gottlieb Messerschmidt, who was sent to explore Siberia by official royal decree of Peter the Great himself in 1716 to collect rarities and medicinal plants from Siberia. The pair seemed to have hit it off really well because they ended up traveling across Siberia together from 1720 to 1727 doing some of the world's most groundbreaking research at the time. They recorded an insane amount of data, the first of its kind, on plants, animals, the landscape, native tribes and everything in between. One of the native tribes they encountered and studied for a little bit were none other than the Ket. And now, thanks to a Swedish army captain and a German scientist, we have a list of cat vocabulary from 300 years ago. <laughs> and you can't really put a price tag on that. <laughs> We're moving on now, but just as a by the way not to leave you hanging, later on, Messerschmitt's work in biology would lead him to the discovery of one of the first ever mammoth fossils, and Stralenberg would eventually return to Sweden, publish one of the first ever books on Siberian geography and anthropology, and live until his early 70s. What an insane life. S someone get me HBO on the phone right away. How is this not a TV series yet? Why don't they teach us this stuff in school? <laughs> in any case, there were a bunch of other travelers and explorers that passed through the area in the 1700s, recording bits of data here and there. But we're gonna fast forward a bit. And then we get to the 1840s, when the first ever full-scale investigation on the Ket language was conducted, resulting in the first proper extensive grammar being produced. This was done by none other than the goat of Siberian linguistics, the warden of Uralic languages, all the way from Finland. Please welcome once again, Matthias, certified legend, Kastren.
Seriously, I can't stop bumping into this guy in almost every linguistic study that I've read in the past couple of months. Is there anything this guy hasn't done before? From 1846 to 1848, he lived in Yeniseyan territory amongst the Ket and other neighboring peoples, systematically recording as much linguistic data as he possibly could. What a guy, man. People should know the name Matthias Alexander Kastren. After Kastren, but before the Soviet period, there are a bunch of other researchers that did a lot of very interesting and very important things, but we're going to fast forward again to the early 1930s, when Soviet collectivization was in full swing. The Ket people were some of the last, one source says literally the last, semi-nomadic peoples to adopt a sedentary lifestyle. Private industry was banned, shamanism was banned, and gradually life was becoming more and more Soviet every day. However, during the early Soviet period, when it comes to language, stuff wasn't actually all that bad. The languages of the indigenous peoples were actually promoted for a little bit, and even Russians moving to these areas were generally encouraged to learn the local language, rather than the other way around. The late 20s and early 30s was a time when the vast majority of indigenous languages within the borders of the USSR gained alphabets and were able to be written down for the very first time, the Ket language being amongst them. As mentioned, up until this point, the Kets were consistently referred to as the Yenisei Ostyaks, but this started to change in the early 1930s when the Soviet government introduced a policy demanding the usage of ethnonyms based on self-designation. And then in 1934, volume 3 of the Languages and Literatures of the Peoples of the North, sort of like an encyclopedia on the subject, was published in Leningrad, clearly naming Ket the official name of the people. This is because in the Ket language, the word Ket means man, and this is what they called themselves, so makes sense. Also in 1934, a man named Nestor Konstantinovich Kargir, student of one Vladimir Bogoraz, who some of you might remember from the Teneville video, created the first Ket alphabet based on the Latin script and the first ever Ket language primer for children and beginner learners. It definitely saw some success, because in the year 2000, one of the elderly Ket speakers, who was an informer for one of the studies that I read, mentioned that they remembered receiving Ket language instruction in school in the 1930s using Karger's book, which is really cool. Unfortunately, all of this lasted a very short time. Basically, because Stalin. In 1935, Karger was arrested by the NKVD and exiled from St. Petersburg, only to be arrested again in 1937 and then mobilized into the Soviet army in 1942 to fight in World War II. And after that, nobody really knows what happened to him. One source says he died during the war, another source says he probably died in the gulag, but we'll likely never know. The man just got disappeared off of the face of the earth without any record. He was rehabilitated, or rather his name was rehabilitated in the eyes of the Russian government in 1991. Great and all, but about 50 years too late if you ask me. Rest in peace, Karger. Thank you for your service in the war, and also linguistics. There's a very famous book called The Gulag Archipelago by Alexander Solzhenitsyn describing the history and the horrors of the Gulag system in the Soviet Union. One of the first pages of the book actually mention Karger and the Ket people in a single sentence. Karger's archive of the Yenisei Ostyaks was swept away. The primer and the writing system he invented were banned. And the little nation was left without a writing system. Probably one of the saddest quotes I've ever read in academic literature. In the late 30s, early 40s, everything kind of started to go downhill. Boarding schools were introduced, indigenous languages were discouraged, everyone had to speak Russian, and children were punished for speaking Ket. On top of that, many indigenous peoples, including a large number of Ket men, were sent to the front lines of World War II, never to be seen or heard from again. One of the main, most important sources for this video is a lecture by Yulia Galamina. Honestly, huge respect to her, look her up, absolute legend, highly recommended, although the lecture specifically is in Russian. Um, but she retold a story which I think fits very well to what we're talking about now. After World War II, a cat man decided he didn't want to live in a Soviet collectivized farm anymore, so he packed his bags, took his daughter, and went off into the forest to live in peace. The daughter never went to school and didn't speak a word of Russian until the age of 11 when she became ill. So her father took her back to the village so that they could treat her. They ended up staying in the village and she was sent to school in Russian. And when she returned from school, she no longer spoke any cat. The reason we even know of this story at all is because the daughter herself was still alive in 2018 and was interviewed by one of the researchers. And by that point, she could only remember a few separate words and didn't speak the language at all anymore. 
Another interesting fact about boarding schools. The boarding school in the region was located in the small town called Baikit in the Evenkiski district, where the vast majority of students were of Evenki nationality. The Evenki are an indigenous group neighboring the Ket, but they have always had a rather turbulent history. And the relationship between the Kets and the Venki hasn't always been in the greatest of terms. Mixed marriages between the Kets and the Venki were also kind of frowned upon. Anyway, because the Ket students were a minority in the boarding school, they were often picked on by the Evenki majority. And so the Kets found some unlikely allies to deal with the Evenki bullies. Russian Old Believers Apparently, even marriages between the Kets and the Russian Old Believers are a relatively common thing today. It's really interesting to me that there's some sort of weird respect and understanding between the two groups based on a mutual dislike of the Evenki. I should also mention another neighboring ethnic group called the Selkup, whose language is of the Uralic language family. They're very closely related to the Nganasans, who I made a video about recently, and they're very distant cousins of the Finns and Hungarians. And the Selkup and the Ket have historically always been like BFFs, they love each other. Boarding schools were a very, very messed up thing that resulted in lifelong trauma for most of the people who went through them. And it's kind of strange to me that even in such a setting where all indigenous people suffer, the Kets and the Evenki could still rarely see eye to eye. But on a lighter note, I'm just picturing these fights going on, like the Kets and the old believers teaming up to fight the Evenki bullies and the Russian teachers trying to like pull them apart from each other, all the while the Selkoops are just kind of chilling there in the corner trying not to get involved. <laughs> Probably not very historically accurate, but pretty funny to visualize. Again, how has Netflix not picked this up yet? In any case, moving on. In February of 1980, the Soviet government came out with a policy on the measures for further economic and social development of areas inhabited by the peoples of the North. And as part of that, there was a movement to develop new writing systems, this time based on Cyrillic. There were two main proposals. One was by another legendary linguist called Yeruhim Abrahamovich Krainovich, who co-authored the languages and literatures of the peoples of the far north that I mentioned earlier. And the other by Genrich Kasparovich Werner and one G. H. Nikolaeva, who I cannot find any information about online whatsoever, not even her full name. That tends to happen sometimes, unfortunately. But by 1988, their final official version was accepted and the first book that used it came out. Uh, links to their work in the description below as well. And then, slowly but surely, we get to the 90s and early 2000s. And with the Soviet Union no longer in the picture, travel to Russia became much easier, which attracted many specialists from overseas. Nowadays, the most famous Ketologist has to be a man called Edward Vida from the United States. He went on a few different expeditions to the Ket homeland and did a ton of groundbreaking research on the subject, including being the main author and proponent of the modern Denean Nesane hypothesis. We'll talk more about Vida and his hypothesis later on. But meanwhile, how is the Ket language doing today? We've mentioned a few statistics in the beginning of the video, but now I want to show you the full picture and explain why the future feels kind of bleak, at least to me. Nothing would make me happier than to be wrong about this. According to several different sources, these are the numbers of the Ket population over the last 100 years. As you can see, the total number of Ket people has remained relatively stable over the course of the 20th century, with the number never really going below a thousand people. Furthermore, another advantage that the Ket seem to have over both other small ethnicities and Russians living in similarly remote regions is that Ket villages are full of children and apparently the whole community just kind of hangs out and chills together regardless of age. The fact that in the vast majority of similarly remote areas people are either leaving or dying, this is quite a statistical anomaly which is pretty cool. However, when we look at the number of Ket speakers, the numbers get a bit more depressing. In 1979, 78.9% spoke Ket. Ten years later, in 1989, 54.3% spoke Ket. And according to official statistics from 2020, only about 14% or 153 people spoke the language, the vast majority of whom being elderly speakers. But from what I've gathered from various sources, even this statistic is rather inflated in the sense that even if a person's first language is Ket, but they've been speaking exclusively Russian for the past half a century and can barely speak string a sentence together, they'll still be included in the statistic. According to Galamina, once again, she states in her lecture that in 2010, there are only 19 people who claim to be fully fluent in Ket, which is a very different number from 150. 
The most dramatic difference can be seen in a survey from 2003, in which people were asked which language they use the most in their daily lives, Russian or Ket. Look at the difference between 60-year-olds and 50-year-olds. It's less than one generation, and the difference is 45% and 5%. Like, you can clearly see the impact the boarding schools left on the community. Also, not a single person from ages 0 to 19 spoke Ket at all, and barely 1% of people up to the age of 30. And again, this survey is from 2003. This was 20 years ago. After the Soviet period ended, there has been a bit of a resurgence and renewed interest in the language. But apparently, not really enough to change the course of the fate of the Ket language. From what I could find, currently, there is only one school in Kellogg that has Ket language lessons for kids. And with barely any teaching materials, limited resources, and the teachers themselves not being fully fluent, the future of the language doesn't look very good, honestly. Unfortunately, linguists, researchers, and government officials can only do so much. For the language to be able to fully thrive again, the initiative has to come from the people themselves, from the Ket people. But also, after decades of neglect and boarding schools, and just living in a rather harsh environment where you have a lot of other more important things to worry about short term, it's hard to find the motivation. Sadly, it's unfortunate, but definitely understandable, and you can't really blame them for it. But I also don't really know what the solution here is now, especially considering the state Russia is in today. <clears throat> As a language nerd, I just want someone somewhere to do something about it. And I currently can't do anything physically to help, you know, but I hope that by making this video, I'm at least doing my part, however small it may be, in raising awareness of not just Ket, but other similar minority languages and endangered languages. This isn't just happening to Ket, this is happening literally all over the world. That was a bit of a depressing note to end that segment on, but I promise you it's only gonna get worse. <laughs> it's gonna get worse because now we're moving on to talk about one of the main reasons why it's so sad that this language is disappearing, and that reason is how absolutely unique and insane the grammar of the language is. Throughout my adventures in language learning, I have never seen a language function quite like this. I have looked at some not in a languages in the past as well, but this is like next level. First of all, let's finally listen to a clip of a native speaker speaking the Ket language so that you can have an idea of what this magical language sounds like. <laughs> Links to other examples of native Ket speakers speaking the Ket language in the description. Okay, right off the bat, we're gonna talk about the number system because it's absolutely ridiculous and I've been waiting all video to show this to you. Okay, so one through seven are all different words. That's all fine. But then once you get to eight, you gotta start doing some math because eight is 10 minus two. And the nine follows that same pattern. Nine is 10 minus one. Also, the way it's literally translated from Ket to English is it is two, it lacks 10 for eight, and it is one, it lacks 10 for 9. It's absolutely wild. <laughs> I love it. And then 10 is just 10. It's its own word. So all is fine here. 11 is 1 above 10. 12 is 2 above 10. And so on until we get to 18, because 18 is 20 minus 2. And 19 is 20 minus 1. And then 20 is 2 times 10. 21 is 1 above 20, or rather 1 above 2 times 10. And then 22 is 2 above 2 times 10, and so on until we get to 28, because at 28, again, it's 30 minus 2. And 29 is 30 minus 1. And then 30 is 3 times 10. So 10 is 10, 20 is 2 times 10, 30 is 3 times 10, and you would think that it would be the same for 40, but no because the number 40 just doesn't really exist in Ket. So we just borrow it from Russian. And 40 in Ket is Sol or Soluk, which comes from the Russian Sorok, which is absolutely insane to me because in Russian, this specific number is widely known to be a very weird number because it just doesn't follow the same pattern as all the other numbers in Russian. So it's just such a weird coincidence that it also doesn't exist in Ket. Like, what are the chances of that? 
And what's even crazier about this is that initially I thought that this is a relatively recent loan word. Makes sense, right? But no, because Messerschmitt, the German scientist we talked about earlier, also recorded the same word in one of his diaries in 1723, which means that this word has been around for at least 300 years. And so like, what did they use before then? Like, I guess it was just meant to be. I guess the number 40 is just cursed for some reason in general. Next we have 50, which is literally just half hundred. So that's fine. And then 60 is six times 10. So at this point, you might be thinking that we're going back to the original pattern, right? Just like 10, 20, and 30. But no, because 70 is 100 minus 30. And then 80 and 90 do come back to that same pattern of 100 minus 20 and 100 minus 10 respectively. But then what the hell is up with 70? Why isn't 7 10 minus 3? Why is it just the 70? And then 100 is just its own word. And then multiples of 100 are just multiples of the next respective digit and so on until we get to 800 and 900 because they like to be different for some reason and they're 1000 minus 200 and 1000 minus 100. But yeah, that's basically the Ket number system. It's not the most complicated system in the world, but I just found it really fascinating because I've just never seen this weird pattern before ever. So let's just take another moment to appreciate it and moving on. Next up, phonology. Officially, Ket has seven vowels and 12 consonants, though there does seem to be quite a bit of allophony, which expands in the phonemic inventory a bit, especially nowadays if you consider the fact that all Ket speakers today are bilingual in Russian. So there are plenty of Russian loanwords which require some extra sounds that aren't native to Ket. Additionally, Ket has at least four distinguishable tones for vowels. However, these aren't exactly tones like you would think of them in Mandarin, for example. They're characterized by specific contours, so stuff like voice creakiness, glottal stops, and vowel length. So these aren't necessarily tones like you would think of them in a traditional sense, but they very much definitely influence the way that you would differentiate very similar sounding words from one another. The one really big thing that stands out to me in the phonemic inventory of Ket is the fact that it lacks both P and G, which is rather rare to lack both of these at the same time. And apparently, apart from Ket, is only really a thing in Arabic, in a random Nigerian language, a random Papuan language, and a random Algonquian language. Which, this could really only mean one thing, and one thing only. Dene Yenisean Afroasiatic Trans New Guinea Niger Congo Algic Language Family Confirmed. Also known as Proto Basque. I'll be taking my Nobel Prize in Linguistics now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Morphology. This is where it's going to get a bit technical, very confusing, and incredibly interesting. Please bear with me. First of all, let's talk about noun classes. The Ket language has three noun classes. Masculine, feminine, and neuter. However, the way they work in the singular and plural is really weird if you're looking at life through Indo-European colored glasses, like me. Masculine singular nouns have their own marker. Masculine and feminine plural nouns have their own marker. And then feminine and neuter singular and neuter plural nouns also have their own marker, which is just such a weird cluster jumble of like, I absolutely love it. It's beautiful. But like, how did, how do you get to this point? If you think it's difficult to differentiate between masculine and feminine in like French or Spanish, good luck with this, buddy. There's another important thing to keep in mind. On top of what we just said, masculine and feminine nouns behave differently than neuter nouns because of the whole divide between animate and inanimate. According to Yulia Galamina, there's a possibility of a noun transitioning from animate to inanimate depending on the state that it's currently in. She gave the example of the word tree, which in Ket, the word tree is feminine and animate. But if you were to chop it down, the tree becomes inanimate and therefore neuter, which makes total sense, but just really complicates stuff here. The word itself doesn't change, but the way that it functions within a sentence changes, which just adds a huge layer of complexity because you always have to keep this in mind. I wouldn't be surprised that there's also a lot of exceptions to this. Or rather, maybe that's not the correct way to put it. I'm looking at this through a European perspective. And because 
Ket traditional culture is very different from your average European nation, something that might be seen as instinctually animate in Ket might be seen as instinctually inanimate in a European culture. So, yeah. And now grammatical cases. Now, when it comes to grammatical cases, Ket technically has 12 of them, but I'm rather confused as to whether the alignment is nominative or absolutive or something in between. According to Vaida, Ket doesn't really have a full case system, but rather a mix of noun-like postpositions and grammatical markers that function like oblique case suffixes. Don't ask me what that means, I apologize, but I'm just going to skip over the explanation of the case system because I'm trying my best not to misinform anyone and I just don't fully understand it. It's Again, it's very weird to me and it's something I've never seen before act like this and it's something that deserves its own video. Ket has a very rich morphology and a very unusual way of building verbs. If there's one thing you need to know about Ket grammar is that the verb is king. And frankly, nouns should feel lucky to just stand next to them. One of the main sources I used for this section is a descriptive grammar of Ket by Stefan Georg, which I cannot recommend highly enough. It's a fascinating read, and if you're really curious about how exactly the language functions and how the grammar functions, please do give it a read because he explains it way better than I ever could. At the start of the verb section, he references a textbook titled Yevo Vilichestva Glagol, which is Russian for His Majesty the Verb. <laughs> you just can't make this up. In a nutshell, Ket is a primarily prefixing language with not many suffixes and absolutely loves incorporation. Suffixes come after the word, prefixes come before the word. So in the world in general, not all languages have these to begin with, but those that do seem to prefer suffixes over prefixes. Not really sure why, but it's just a typological fact of the world's languages. So with ket preferring prefixes, it's already a bit unusual to begin with. There are up to 15 position classes, and nearly all of them come as prefixes before the lexical root. In this diagram, we can see the root being in the end. And if we want to add a subject or an object person or a determiner or tense or whatever else, all of that comes before the lexical root, which again, when it comes to the typology of languages across the world, it's not something you see every day at all. In any case, now I have two really cool examples that demonstrate some of the weird ways all of this functions. Take the two sentences, she sees him and he sees her. Both the pronouns for he and she are the same. They're both just boo. So how do you tell them apart? Thanks to the verb, which shows the relationship between the two. So in the sentence, she sees him, bubu da tong, the tong part at the end is the verb to see. And then da is the third person female subject, while a is the third person masculine object. And then the sentence, he sees her, bubu di tong, in there, the d is the third person masculine subject and the e is the third person feminine object. Thanks to the magic of the ket verb, you don't even really need the boo boo in the beginning there. Just say the one word, da tong or di tong, and just from the different morphemes, it's pretty much a fully understandable sentence on its own. I love it when languages have the option to do this. The next example has to do with possessive clitics. So take the sentence, his tent. Tent is kos, and the word for his is attached as a clitic before the noun. So da kos means his tent. Pretty understandable so far. However, now let's look at a bit of a more complex sentence. His tent is not at the river. Take a second to pause the video and understand what the actual hell is going on here. The proclitic da, which used to be attached to the tent, which made total sense because it's his tent, turns into an enclitic ra and attaches itself at the end of river at. And then you get tent and then you get not is. So keeping to the Ket grammatical standard, this sentence would be literally translated into English as river at his tent not is. Have you ever seen anything like this? Because me personally, I sure haven't. I feel like I'm not stressing this enough. The friggin' possessive his, 
which made total sense being attached to the noun tent, because it's his tent, changed its form and attached itself to two seemingly unrelated words, river at, then comes the tent by itself, and then the noun not is. Like, why would the his be attached to the river at and not the tent? But it's still absolutely insane for me to just look at it and just just wow, honestly. By the way, some of the researchers claim that the difficulty of the language itself is another not insignificant reason as to why the speaker base has declined so much. It may sound kind of funny and fake, but if you think about it, staying fully fluent in a language like this throughout your entire life with barely any practice, you're eventually gonna forget how to properly structure sentences with all these grammatical nuances, especially if you consistently speak a cardinally different language to Ket, such as Russian. But now it's time to move on to the final major section of the video, the dene yenisein hypothesis and what makes the whole thing somewhat controversial. First of all, the Yenisean branch used to comprise of a few different languages, but pretty much all of them went extinct in the last 300, 200 and 100 years. Except for Ket, my boy Matthias Kastren collected quite a bit of data on the Kot language, one of the southernmost Yenisean languages that went extinct about the mid 1800s. And except for that, most notably, a lot of data was collected on the Yuch language. The Yuch language, neighboring Ket just to the south, went extinct as a language sometime in the 1970s, but with plenty of data being collected on it, definitely linking it to the Yenisean branch. When it comes to people though, according to a Russian census from 2010, they counted one single ethnic Yuch left in the world. But then in another census in 2020, they counted seven ethnic Yuchs. I couldn't really find much online about the difference here and, and how this happened, but either way, it's more than likely that unfortunately, the Yuch ethnicity might not survive much longer in general. The Nadine language family, on the other hand, looks like this. It's split into two main branches, Tlingit, which is a language that forms a branch of its own, and Athabascan Iyak. And with this branch, Iyak is kind of its own thing, while the Athabascan languages are split into three main groups. The northern group, spoken in Alaska and northern Canada, with languages such as Dena'ina, Gwich'in, and Dogrib, and many more. The Pacific group in California, Washington, and Oregon, with languages such as Hupa and Toloa. And the southern group, which by far has the most speakers, spoken in Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, and the surrounding states, and examples include Navajo and Apache. I still can't fully wrap my head around the fact that these languages are related to a language spoken in friggin' Siberia. Absolutely mad. Super, super cool. Over the course of the 20th century, there has been a ton of different proposals and attempts to link a ton of different languages into a single big macro language family, including the Yenisean languages. But a lot of them were a bit far-fetched, to say the least, with not enough evidence and not enough research done to actually put forward a convincing analysis. But in 2008, Edward Vida summarized 10 years of research on verbal morphology and reconstruction of proto-languages, reaffirming the existence of the dene yeniseyan connection. Out of all of the past proposals, this one definitely had the most plausibility, with how many different cognates were found between Nadine and Yeniseyan languages. Like, we're talking hundreds here, and it certainly started to look a lot less like just a coincidence. Despite this, there were many problems with this hypothesis to begin with, because first of all, sound changes, the differences between phonologies of Ket and different Nadine languages is pretty big, and I mean, we're talking about thousands of years here after all. Especially, especially when we specifically compare Ket to Tlingit, which as I mentioned is spoken in Alaska, and it constitutes its own branch of the Nadine language family. Ket has 20 to 30-ish phonemes, depending on if you count the allophones that I mentioned earlier, while Tlingit has 47, and only 11 of those are shared. On top of that, the most striking difference you'll notice in Tlingit is that it completely lacks any labial plosives, p and b, which these two are some of the most common sounds found throughout the world in general. And Tlingit just doesn't have them, like at all. And so when comparing specifically Ket and Tlingit, it would be very difficult to see any sort of connection here whatsoever. But honestly, the more I read about Tlingit specifically, the more wild it seems to me in general. And I don't know if it's a very good example in this case. It's, it's definitely a story for another time. One of the biggest earliest critics of Edward Vida was a professor in linguistics, Lyle Campbell, 
who argues that even if there is an alleged common ancestor, so much time has passed and so many sound changes that by this point it would be pretty much impossible to accurately reconstruct a proto-language. And so there's not really even a point in trying. On top of that, some researchers, particularly a Russian linguist by the name of Georgi Starostin, questioned Vida's proposal by stating, Vida's regular correspondences are not properly regular in the classic comparative historical sense of the word. Vida's treatment of the verbal morphology involves a tiny handful of intriguing isomorphisms, surrounded by an impenetrable sea of assumptions and highly controversial internal reconstructions that create an illusion of systemic reconstruction where there really is none. But then again, he later goes on to say that Vida's work is by all means a step forward. So that's kind of good, I guess, right? The general assumption here is that between 12 to 15,000 years has passed since the migration to the Americas. However, what's really interesting here is that it's likely that when Nadine speakers migrated to the Americas, the ancestors of the Ket split off and actually came back to Asia, eventually reaching Siberia, which to me is one of the coolest and most surprising aspects of this whole thing. But then, apart from all the linguistic stuff, one of the biggest undeniable pieces of evidence of the relation between Yeniseian and Nadine languages is the DNA evidence. The Y haplogroup is overwhelmingly present amongst the Kets, one of the only such instances outside of South and North America. I might be wrong here, but DNA doesn't joke around. I'm not sure if coincidences are even a thing when it comes to DNA. Interestingly enough, the Selkoops of the Uralic language family and one of the Kets' closest friends also share a significant amount of the Y haplogroup, demonstrating the generations of intermarriage between the two. Which, a bit of a sidetrack once again, but if you think about it, the Selkoops might be the only group of people in the world to share a common ancestor with both Aztecs and Incas and Finns and Hungarians at the same time. Technically, if you look at the DNA. But, you know, I'm not, I don't know any, anything about DNA, so I might be exaggerating here. I'm going to leave a link in the description to Edward Vida's lecture on the Ket language, where he goes into much more detail on the genetic and linguistic relationship between the Yeniseian and Nadine peoples. Highly recommended, and he explains it way better than I do. And now, as much as it pains me to say, we are about to reach the conclusion of the video. However, there are still a few other random things that I just didn't know where else to fit in. First of all, meet Alexander Kotusov. He passed away in 2019, and he was one of the last fully fluent experts on the Ket language. And not just that, but he also wrote a ton of songs and poems in the Ket language. He apparently even translated some Russian and Jewish folk songs, as well as some prison songs into the Ket language, which is just such a cool mixture, I think. From what I read about him, he had a very difficult life, but he always held his native language very dear to him and felt the need to express himself in it through song. Here's a short clip I found of him singing one of the songs. <laughs> Another thing that I just can't not mention is while doing research, I came across one Mikhail Tarkovsky, nephew of Andrei Tarkovsky, one of the most famous and influential film directors of Russia, some may argue of all time. In the late 80s, he actually moved to some place along the Yenisei River and lived with the Ket. He was involved in filming a documentary about the region, the way of life there, and the beauty of the land. The documentary is called Shislivy Ludi, or Happy People, which has an absolutely absurd amount of views on YouTube. I can't believe I have never heard of it. And at first I was like, oh, you know, that's a, that's a pretty cool fact that I didn't expect to read. You know, that's pretty cool. But then I found an article from Altai State University where Mikhail Tarkovsky talks about some of his experiences while he was there. And in the article, there was this one quote that absolutely made my jaw drop, and I just have to share it with you. Do you feel any special unity with nature? Do you engage in spiritual practices? A question came from the audience. 
The Japanese were engaged in spiritual practices in the area of the Ket village. They ate too many mushrooms and the poor Kets had to chase after them all over the taiga. While we built an orthodox church, these practices are somehow closer to us. Quick side note, the word I translated as mushroom into English is known in Russian as muhamor. Apparently in English it's called an amanita, never knew that, but it's one of the most potent, psychedelic, and toxic mushroom species in the world. If you think there's any more context to this quote in the article, unfortunately that's not the case. They just casually drop this bomb on you out of nowhere and it just blows my mind. Japanese people, how did they get here? There wasn't a single mention of Japanese anything in any of the studies I've read up until this point. And like, how did they get there? Why did they eat the mushrooms? <laughs> what the hell is happening? I'm Sean, I do not endorse drugs. Please don't do drugs, drugs are bad. Get off my lawn, yada yada. I'm just picturing a bunch of Japanese people tripping absolute balls running through the forest in all directions while the cats are desperately trying to catch them. All the while in the background, there's Mikhail Tarkovsky casually just too busy nailing hammers on the church walls that he's building. <laughs> this is absolutely hilarious and I really wish there was more context. But in any case, this is where our story comes to an end. I have genuinely had so much fun researching this topic and I really hope you enjoyed listening to me talk about it. There will be a bajillion links in the video description below. I list all of the sources that I used, both English and Russian, and I highly recommend you check them out. To all the cat people out there, I wish you all nothing but the very best. I really do hope that your unique culture and language survives and thrives for many generations to come. And to all the people out there across the world who speak an endangered language, please speak it, live it, keep it alive and pass it on to the next generation. Because in the vast, vast majority of cases, once it's gone, it's gone forever. But in the meantime, that's about it. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you have a great day and a wonderful night. And as they say in Ket, Right, I'm not gonna do that. Ture ekung dinga bisep das kansa tam anyagas kung sigas ukbang dingal tam ases banga hising dinga kat hai tingal ses da ilga italam bu kote dik karendis hai bin dudis ture bilde Budan Sugam Datol Lung Bilde Buddha Ulbe Hai Bang Daun Torgon Daulbe Ture Tovine Budengang Kote Kang Bong Itan Yam The Sas Kam as Daikis Sives Dakrega Kam as Konestak Sanan sult as senan kes. Bye.